Good afternoon. I'm Wendy Craig and I'm the Scientific Director of PrevNet. And on behalf of our team, I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today. Wherever you are located, please join us in acknowledging and thanking the generations of Indigenous peoples who have cared for these lands and in celebrating the continued strength and spirit of the Indigenous peoples. We are bringing today's webinar from the Community of Practice to Address Teen Dating Violence, funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Today's webinar, The Neuroscience of Trauma, Strategies for Professionals Working with Youth Who Have Experienced Teen Dating Violence, is being led by Dr. Marla Buchanan from the University of British Columbia. Before I introduce Marla, I'd like to go through our webinar format for today. Marla will present for approximately 55 minutes, and during her presentation, we invite you to type any comments or questions that you may have for her into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. We will track these questions and pull them at the end of her presentation and ask her some of these key questions. At the end of the webinar, in the chat box, you will see a link to the evaluation. That's the evaluation of this webinar. We really value the responses that people provide us through these evaluations, and they help guide us when planning for future webinars. All of your feedback is anonymous, so please take the short period of time to complete the survey. Once you have completed the evaluation form, you'll be directed to a website where you'll be prompted to enter your full name and email address. And once you've done that, a certificate of attendance will be generated and emailed to you. And I just want to stress that even though you fill in this part with your name in order to get the certificate of attendance, your name is not associated or attached to the evaluation form at all. They are anonymous. The webinar is being recorded today, so after the webinar, we will send out a link to everyone that's registered so that they can share the recording or listen to it if they wish to join uh, us, or they weren't able to join us, sorry, today. We will also post the slides of today's presentation in both English and French. I also want to note that Marla has three handouts that she will refer to the presentation. These handouts are preloaded into the webinar. And so participants can view Marla's handouts by clicking the handout tab in the control panel during the presentation. Okay, that's all about the beginning part. Now it's about listening to the real experts. We are absolutely delighted and it is my true pleasure to introduce Dr. Marla Buchanan. She is a professor in counseling psychology in the Department of Education and Counseling Psychology and Special Education. She holds the Royal Canadian Legion Professorship and is the past director of the Center for Group Counseling and Trauma. Her research interests include studies on tra traumatic stress among various populations, including veterans, women in prison, children and youth trauma, refugee trauma, and indigenous mental health. We are truly grateful that she's here to share her expertise and wisdom, and it's my pleasure. And I'm now gonna turn the presentation over to her because we have much to learn and we're excited about this opportunity. Thank you, Marla. Thank you, Wendy, for that kind introduction. Uh, so today, the talk is about trauma, trauma and teen dating violence. Uh, as you can see on the first slide, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk is a book that he wrote about how to work with trauma. Almost everything I've ever learned about trauma, I've learned from Bessel van der Kolk. And this book, I'll show it to you now, is a great starting place for learning about what trauma is and how to work with it. He really is an expert in the field. Um, so if you're interested in working in traumatic stress, that's a good place to start. As he discusses in the book, he talks about new discoveries in the neuroscience and functional MRI research that helps us answer questions about where trauma resides in the brain and in the body. And with this new evidence, we we're able now to design treatments that work with both the traumatized mind and the body. But before I get into the neuroscience of trauma and teen dating violence, I'd like to contextualize this talk today first. We probably all know of someone or have heard about someone who has experienced teen dating violence. Someone who has experienced physical, sexual, psychological, or emotional abuse, someone who perhaps is being stalked either in person or on social media, who's being harassed or bullied, a teen who comes into your office and tells you the story about being depressed, anxious, nervous, having trouble sleeping, 
feeling very sensitive and touchy and easily startled, having no appetite, feeling very sensitive, having no energy, doesn't want to go to school, can't concentrate in class, can't focus on other outside activities, whose grades are slipping, whose parents are worried, whose teachers are concerned. This teen wants to isolate and have no social contact. She worries about others and how what others are saying about her. She feels stigmatized, hurt, ashamed, and perhaps guilty. And now this teen is standing at your office door asking you for help. So where do we start? Well, the first place is to listen. We try to make a meaningful connection with this teen by using empathy and compassion. And then we offer assistance by making a plan together. But what tools do you need to make that plan with this teen? Especially if it turns out that this teen has developed post-traumatic stress. So just a moment before I get into the neuroscience of trauma, I wanna explain what post-traumatic stress is. There are four main symptom areas of post-traumatic stress. And today we hear a lot of people talking about trauma. Everything's a trauma, like you know, getting a B plus instead of an A is a trauma. But what we mean by post-traumatic stress comes from the DSM-5, and it has four main criteria. The first being intrusive imagery, such as flashbacks, nightmares, night terrors. The second is hypoarousal symptoms, uh, such as an over-exaggerated startle response. The third area is avoidance and numbing out. Uh, and the fourth is mood changes, such as uh, depression or suicidal ideation. And the trauma has to be something that the individual felt was life-threatening. And it has to persist for at least three months before it can be labeled as a post-traumatic stress symptom or symptoms. So today's topic, I'm going to talk about the understanding of neuroscience that will assist you in working with teens who have experienced dating violence. The assumption here is that teens uh, I will be talking about have been traumatized by the events. Not all teens who have experienced dating violence will have trauma or will have post-traumatic stress symptoms, but some will. And so for those that come to your doorstep, Here's some suggestions I'm going to talk to you about, about what you could do about that. So the brain from the bottom up, the second slide. The reptilian brain is the brainstem and it comes online when we're born. It functions in ways about how we eat when we're hungry, when we sleep, when we wake, when we cry, when we breathe, <laughs> how we feel temperature. Sorry, that's my coffee maker the background there. Uh, we also have a limbic system, which is the seat of emotions. It's in the middle of the brain. It monitors danger. It is called the central command post for safety. Together, the reptilian brain and the brain stem and the limbic system in the midbrain form the emotional brain. We have a triune brain, a three-part brain that's, that's responsible for uh, trauma. The reptilian brain, which I just described, governs arousal, homeostasis, and our reproductive drives. It is the first to come online when we're born. Then we develop a limbic brain soon after, I think around eight months, 12 months old, we start to have functioning in the limbic brain. It surrounds the reptilian brain, is, is concerned with emotion, memory, and some social behaviors, and learning, and our relational experiences. Then the neocortex develops. It is the last to develop, and it enables self-awareness, conscious thought, logic, and reasoning. There are three levels of information processing that come into the triune brain. There are three ways that we get the signals from the outside world in terms of information we need to know to survive. We have cognitive information processing that involves our beliefs, thoughts, or interpretations. We have emotional information processing in terms of our feelings and our affective processing. And we have sensory motor information processing that comes in the form of physical and sensory responses, sensations, and movements. In all, we have that in the triune brain, a brain within a brain within a brain. Here's a picture of the cortex 
and the brain, the whole brain. And if you look on the right hand side, the part that's hanging out on the right hand side, that's the cortex. In the middle of the brain, you'll see a part, part of a loop in the middle, that is the limbic system. And then you see the brain stem hanging down and that is the reptilian brain. If you could turn now to the handout that, uh, that is attached to your PowerPoint today, this is the first one. I'd like to talk about this a little bit before I go on to the next slide. So if you look at the right-hand side of the page, you'll see uh, the brainstem, a little purple box that describes what the brainstem is all about. Above that is the limbic system, and it describes what the limbic system is all about. And I'm going to go into this in more detail in a moment. And then on top, we have the neocortex. Notice that under the dotted line, the reptilian brain and limbic brain are not conscious. They are, do not have anything to do with conscious thought. It's only when signals go through the reptilian brain up through the limbic system that they then go up into the neocortex. And that's when thinking takes place. When trauma takes place, we either go into fight, flight, or freeze. When you're about to be attacked or victimized in some way or under some survival threat, the first thing you do is power up to leave, power up to escape, power up to fight. So your heart is beating, you're sweating perhaps, you're breathing really fast, and you're already moving, you're already in running, in a running mode, in an escape mode, before the brain thinks, oh my God, a cougar. So you're already, your system is already so neat, micro nanosecond speed, you're already moving before the attack takes place. So it takes a few nanoseconds before the neocortex hit, kick, kicks in. So look, please look over to the left side of the brain because I want to describe the autonomic nervous system, which has everything to do with fight, flight, and freeze. There are two branches of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The, it's called the hot zone and the cool zone. The hot zone is about the fight flight part of the brain. When we're under threat, we either want to get out of there really bad, fast or we want to fight off the threat. Uh, what's happening is we have a big shot of uh, steroids coming through, stress hormones are shooting through us and it helps us to motivate our muscles and get out really fast. However, what happens when we can't escape danger, when we cannot fight it off or we cannot flee? Then the mammalian brain goes into a freeze state, it collapses, it feigns death. Um, it also when it's not in a, in a um, trauma situation, is also our comfort and soothing state. It's where we rest and relax, where we restore and recuperate. But under threat, it can freeze. So what we'll see in the animal world is that the animal will collapse and feign death. And sometimes the prey animals won't bite them because they're not interested in something that's dead. So through evolution, uh, human beings have also developed the free state, and we know this state as dissociation, uh, a state of numbing out, a state of uh, going offline. You know, you can see people who are in this state have the thousand mile stare. They're not there. Um, so if you look at the bottom box, it says the SNS or PNS responses are about intensifying or calming down the body. They alter blood circulation. It alters, it triggers hormonal and endocrine activation. It changes muscle tone and posture and increases or decreases cognitive arousal. On the right hand side at the bottom are four things one could do to attend to uh, calming the body. And I'm gonna go through these types of ideas a little later in the presentation. But this handout is something I always give clients when I'm explaining this and doing psychoeducation about the neuroscience of the brain and trauma in terms of what happens with uh, trauma with the brain. So it's, it's something you can hand out to them and give to them and help explain it to them. So 
that they don't feel like they're going mentally ill or that it's their fault, it's their brain on trauma, and it's something that we can actually work with. So uh, another really good thing that you can do with a client is to show them Dan Siegel's hand brain. So he takes his hand, he folds his thumb in here, and he collapses his fingers down over, over his thumb. So if you see this, this is the brain stem. If you open this up, this is the midbrain. This is the limbic system. This would be the hippocampus. And this little module here would be the amygdala. It's like an almond shape. And then this is the last to develop. Actually, the neocortex, the brain structures continue to grow until about the age of 27. So the teen brain is not fully structured yet. And then this actually, in real life, folds down, folds down, folds down, and covers the limbic brain. That's how the brain develops. So on the next slide, I want to talk about what happens when trauma comes. Well, first, the limbic system commands the uh, sympathetic nervous system to prepare for fight or flight. If there's not enough time, it commands the body to freeze, which is a hypotonic response. Now both the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems are highly activated. It is an analgesic effect, numbing the body and the mind. People report being in an altered state, like going dead or being unable to fight back, are frequent reactions to physical violence, torture, and sexual assault. Post-traumatic stress disorder is characterized by chronic autonomic nervous system hyperarousal. The alarm is almost always on. As the sympathetic nervous system arousal is always high, people wonder why they are so reactive and cannot handle the daily stressors of life. They actually think that they're going crazy. They don't understand why they're always triggered, why they're always exhausted by life events. There are four important parts of the brain that have everything to do with trauma. Vandercote calls it the cook, the central command system, the hippocampus, the smoke detector, which is the amygdala, and the watchtower, which is the medial prefrontal cortex. I'm going to talk about each of these in turn. Well, I'm actually only going to talk about number two, three, and four. <laughs> so here's the hippocampus. It has uh, been labeled as the seahorse of the brain. It has a shape like a seahorse, an upside down seahorse. And it receives input and sends messages to the amygdala and finally to the cortex. It is the central command station. It's essential structure for encoding and storing memory and learning and plays a central role in our ability to compare different memories and make inferences from previous learning. Chronic stress can cause the death of the hippocampal neurons and shrinkage if the alarm has been on too long. And it is due to the effects of long periods of exposure to cortisol. That what happens then is that the hippocampus cannot infer past from present. It's always an alarm. So when you think about the work that we do in trauma, if we're able to do trauma repair, have people really work with their bodies to calm and be in a calm state, then the hippocampus actually comes back to growth. But those who've had trauma for a long, long time, uh, through brain scans, we've been able to see that the hippocampus actually shrinks and stops functioning. So the alarm is constantly on and the central command post is off, offline. So the, the neocortex can't think, doesn't know what's going on. The body has its way with us and there's no control. So the amygdala, this is the smoke detector. This is the alarm part of the brain. Um, it initiates the sympathetic nervous system and with post-traumatic stress, it becomes overactive, which results in a generalization of a fear response so that the person increases his or her fearful behavior always wants to be fighting something off, always wants to be flying and fleeing away, or always is collapsing into a numbed state like dissociation. This explains the overreaction as seen in dissociated people. Everything shuts down when they're triggered. So the alarm is what sets off all the triggers that clients feel on a daily basis. 
but what is the relationship between the hippocampus and the amygdala? Understanding this is important for clients. The relationship is extremely important to human experience and contributes significantly to top-down, left-right integration. The amygdala is biased towards right and down systems, and the hippocampus is biased towards left and top processing. So right and down systems are all about the emotional, the uh, sensory, the feeling states, and the up processing left side is all about the neocortex, information processing, cognitive thoughts, thinking, reason, rationality. The amygdala has a major role in emotional and somatic organization, whereas the hippocampus is vital for conscious, logical, and social functioning. Their relationship will impact affect regulation, reality testing, resting states of arousal and anxiety, and our ability to learn emotional and more neural information. So when we're working with trauma, we're working to reset the hippocampus and the amygdala through body work, basically through sensory motor psychotherapy. So the prefrontal cortex, the medial prefrontal cortex, is where the memories and the understanding of what's going on in that traumatic event take place. It's a part of the cognitive processing system. It is the purple uh, side of this picture here. It regulates the generalization of the fear response and the overall increase in fearful behavior that's initiated by the amygdala. It suppresses the stress response and plays a role in regulation of cortisol, which is a stress hormone plays an important role in emotional regulation. It is important in the retrieval of memories when you're working in, in uh, trauma repair. So this part is really important about getting the message and being conscious about what is going on in your body, how this trigger is affecting you, and what you can do about it. So you have to have conscious understanding in order to have change. So we want this to be online. So Bessel says, learning how to breathe calmly and remaining in a state of relative physical relaxation, even while accessing painful and horrifying memories, is an essential tool for recovery. Relationships. This is key in trauma, in trauma work, well, in any kind of clinical work at all. The relationship is tendemont. It is everything. It's not just the relationship with clients, it's your relationship with yourself, it's your client's relationship with him or herself, and it's our relationship with our peers, our family, our neighbors, our outside world, and our communities. He states, you have to find someone you can trust enough to accompany you, someone who can safely hold your feelings and help you listen to the painful memories from your emotional brain. You need a guide who is not afraid of your terror, who can contain your darkest rage, someone who can safeguard the wholeness of you while you explore the fragmented experience that you had to keep secret from yourself for so long. Most traumatized individuals need an anchor and a great deal of coaching to do this work. So he talks about in his book, The Body Keeps the Score, he talks about what needs to happen if you're going to work in the field of traumatic stress? So first off, trauma profoundly changes how we perceive the world. And Janoff Bullman wrote a book called, in 2010, wrote a book called Shattered Assumptions, in which she explains through research how three main core belief systems are shattered when trauma comes. The first belief system is that the world is benevolent. Now the world becomes malevolent. The world is not a safe place and there is no one that you can trust. Secondly, uh, is, uh, they sh what is shattered is meaningfulness. The world is meaningful. Now the world becomes meaningless. And it challenges our spirituality, our belief systems in terms of what is, um, what is life worth living for if you can't trust and predict random acts of violence. 
And the third area is in uh, an area called the self is worthy. So we have a core belief when we're born that the self is worthy. But over a lifetime of stress and trauma, we come to believe that self is not worthy. Uh, trauma can really, really affect one's sense of self and one's identity in the world. So the work is about, the cognitive work about this trauma work is about addressing those three assumptive uh, worldviews and to get them back uh, into a healthy state. He also talks about trauma as a response to the whole organism. It's not just something in the brain, it's something that affects the whole body. Developmental trauma, when he's talking about developmental trauma, he's talking about early childhood adverse experiences. Um, if you don't know about the study by Vincent Folletti on adverse childhood experiences, I would suggest that you uh, Google that and read about it. Um, Vincent Folletti has done a study with over 17,000 people. He was able to determine that early childhood negative experiences, adverse experience such as neglect, abuse, physical violence, family violence, uh, abandonment, have huge impacts on our uh, emotions and on our bodies, on our ability to thrive. And it has long-term, lifelong consequences into adulthood. So I would suggest you look that up because it's really an important thing you might want to share with people, share with teens about addressing this now would be important for having a better and healthier life. So we can directly train our arousal system by the way that we breathe, the way we sing, chant, the way we move, consciously move, interact with others. And basically attunement is the core of affect regulation. Attunement with ourselves and attunement with others. It's all about the relationships internally and externally. It's about honing in on those, being consciously aware of those and working uh, to make it be healthier. So traumatized people need to have physical and sensory experiences to unlock the trauma within their bodies. That has lots to do with why we're always triggered. We need to work on active, effective fight-flight responses. So if you didn't get a chance to flee, then you do imaginative sort of visualizations of being able to flee or to fight it off more effectively. We will have to learn how to tolerate our sensations, understand our, our sensations first, our triggers, and then be able to tolerate them, and to be, then be able to calm them down. We want to befriend our inner experience, and we want to cultivate new action patterns. Vander Koch says very strongly that it is no longer about the talking cure in terms of traditional psychotherapy we have to include the body in our work now. We have to learn somatic practices to help uh, repair the trauma. So how do we work with teens traumatized by dating violence? What strategies can we learn from self-regulation theory and empirically supported trauma treatments that can help us in this work? The next slide, the next handout you have is called Three circles of emotional regulation. You can see it on the screen, but it also looks like this. Uh, it's about understanding how self-regulation is key to trauma repair. And this comes from Paul Gilbert. Gilbert is an expert in self-compassion theory. Uh, he wrote a book on the compassionate mind. He and uh, Christine Neff have lots of workshops and online courses on um, compassion uh, self-compassion therapy. It's very effective. It's really helpful when you're working with someone who has a very critical inner mind, um, a mindset that's always attacking themselves, putting themselves down. It's very shame-filled shame type of uh, cognitive processing. And self-compassion really does help with that internal critic. So he shows us here three systems, the drive system, a threat system, and a soothing system. The drive system, we can, you've already been, uh, I've already talked to you about the thrive, and, the drive and threat system, which is in the sympathetic nervous system side of the autonomic nervous system. And the soothing system is a parasympathetic system, that part of the, the nervous system. 
So the drive system is really helpful. It helps us achieve goals and complete tasks. It helps us feel motivated and vital. And the main hormone that's being shot through there is dopamine. But the threat system, is, its function is to manage threat, to protect us, to help us survive, and to seek safety. The main hormone being thrust out there is cortisol. We have that when we're feeling anxious, angry, disgusted, having sadness, depression, and feeling shame. In trauma, the drive system and the threat system are online most of the time, and the soothing system, as you can see in the box on the lower right, starts to shrink. The soothing system's function is to slow down, to soothe, to find rest, and to digest, to feel safe, have kindness, and care. Its related hormone is oxytocin, and it helps us feel content, safe, and connected. So I think this is another thing that you can share with teens to talk about what's going on. Before you start teaching them self-regulation, emotional regulation strategies, it might be helpful for them to understand the systems that are at work there. And also, if you now turn to the next handout, which is on the window of tolerance, this window of tolerance comes from Dan Siegel's work on mindfulness and also from Pat Ogden's work in sensory motor psychotherapy. The idea is that we don't want to work with a client or with a teen who is hyper aroused or hypo aroused because nothing will happen. The repair will not take place. The information is not going to sink in. We need to be working with people in the comfort zone. So the window of tolerance when you first start the work might be very narrow, but over time as you teach self-regulation strategies and work with triggers and work with support systems and resourcing, that window of tolerance will grow and the hyperarousal and the hypoarousal states will shrink. If you look at the top, hyperarousal people in the fight-flight response, if you see the bulleted list, this is what they're experiencing. Anxiety, anger, feeling rigid, maybe having addictions and oral reading, having obsessive compulsive thoughts, feeling impulsive. And if they're in the hypoaroused state, they may be dissociated, they may have memory loss, they may feel shut down and disconnected, they may feel separate from self and others and from their feelings. So if you look at the little orange box on the right hand side in the zone, in the comfort zone, in the regulated zone. These are some of the strategies you can use with teens to keep them in the window of tolerance while you're working with them. This is another sheet that I would share with them. It's psychoeducational and it explains to them when you say to them, okay, time out, time to take some breaths time to uh, calm down and regulate. They'll understand what you're doing because you've explained the window of tolerance. You could even say, you're outside the window of tolerance right now. You're hyper aroused. Let's try to bring it down so that what we're doing together today will work, we'll have a chance. Strategies it's suggesting here are mindfulness, grounding, self-soothing techniques, emotional regulation, uh, regulate, recognizing limited beliefs and statements about self and making new choices. What causes one to go out of the window of, violent, of tolerance is the fear of our unconscious thoughts and bodily feelings, wanting to be in control, feeling unsafe, feeling that you don't exist, feeling abandoned and rejected. Trauma-related core beliefs about self are triggered when you're, in the, when you're out of the window of uh, tolerance. So it's really important to teach um, teens how to regulate, how to calm, how to be in their bodies, to understand their body sensations, and to understand the triggers that shoot them up into hyperarousal or hypoarousal. So what do we, where do we start? What do we do first? Well, in trauma therapy, safety is always first. And what that means is safety on many different levels. So you want to initiate strategies to restore a sense of safety in your relationship together. How safe is your office space? How comforting and soothing is it? How safe are you? 
are you regulated? Do you come in with a strong sense of calm, uh, empathy, and compassion? And does the other person coming towards you feel that? Can they feel the safeness of you? Then we want to teach uh, teens how to internally feel safe within themselves. I'm gonna go through some strategies next about how to get that internal safety. Um, the next part, and you don't wanna do any trauma work until you have safety and a, a real strong sense that they internally can handle and get to safety quickly so that they can stay within the window of tolerance. And the next level of safety that you have to check out is in social relationships. Do they have safety in their family? Do they have safe connections with their peers? Do they have someone out there in a support system that they can count on? So what's their backup plan? Who can they go to? And how do they describe that safety? Is it really safe? Um, because this, when they leave your office, you want to make sure they have safety in their environments and their context. Also, let's look at safety in terms of the community that they live in. Is the school a safe space for them? How can you create safety within that school or that neighborhood or in that community, in that church, wherever they're involved uh, in their social lives? You want to have a plan for safety on all these levels before you start doing any kind of trauma work. Then you want to start working on self-regulation strategies. You don't have to be a trauma therapist, a trauma specialist to do self-regulation. Um, and these are some of the very basic ways that you can do self-regulation. I want to show you um, this Dialectical Behavior Skills Training Manual. It has a huge number of pages on emotional regulation, on strategies for um, grounding, relaxation, and all kinds of things on cognitive distortion and belief systems. It's a very good text. Uh, you could take the uh, DBT training, which is offered online. It's very, very good. Another book, which is smaller and just as helpful, is Dialectical Behavior Therapy for Children and Adolescents. Lots of wonderful exercises in there and handouts. And finally, the Psychosomatic Psychotherapy Toolbox book by uh, Pat Ogden? No, it's not. It's by Manuela Mish Reads, but it is a book that Pat Ogden recommends, <clears throat> and it has wonderful strategies for working somatically with the body. 125 worksheets and exercises to teach to treat trauma and stress. So those are three books that you can uh, look at, there's all kinds of information online on breathing exercises, relaxation exercises, grounding exercises, tons of YouTube videos on these things. Uh, so that basically with the breathing exercises, what, is I, what I do is teach teens how to belly breathe. So just for a second, if you just breathe in through your nose and you feel your belly expanding and if you hold it for just the count of three, and very slowly exhale through your nose. What I do with these exercises is I have them on a, on a scale of one to 10. When they It's very brief, three to five minutes of these exercises and have them do another count. Always it comes down. And what they're learning is that the triggered state, the, un the uncomfortable state is really transitory. It's a very short, it's something that can be very shortened. It's not something that you're always feeling. It's not with you 100% of the time. So uh, some self-soothing exercises that you can use come, come, I take from Peter Levine's work on somatic experiencing and from Pat Ogden's work. One is Peter has you put your hand over your heart and put your hand, other hand here and do a little bit of a grip. Try that right now. It's like holding yourself. And you know, when you're doing this, no one's really noticing that you're doing this. Teens can do this in the classroom or in the hallway. No one's going to know. Pat Ogden does the butterfly where you're just tapping 
And this is a wonderful way of regulating the body. And you can also tap, if you're sitting and you have a desk, under the desk, you can tap on the top of your thighs. And that helps just regulate the body down to a comfort zone. There are many self-soothing exercises that you can use. Um, emotion freedom technique, which is also called tapping by Nick Ortner. You can go online and get this, motion freedom technique. Tons of stuff around tapping. Uh, it's about, it's like acupuncture points and it really works. They could go to the washroom and do some tapping and come back and be fine. Another thing they could do, which I've done when I'm in a really tense situation in, in committee work where we're having big arguments, I will be tapping, you know, underneath into my um, hand here, just underneath the table. Just help myself calm down before I speak. Should have done that this morning. And some visualization techniques I use. I use visualization that incorporates all five senses. So what I'm trying to do is have them visualize a safe place. Now, we don't necessarily call it a safe place. They may think that's really hokey. We also don't talk about mindfulness practices because teens hate that word. Um, so you have to find words that, that resonate with them. So an example might be, I'm going to help you with a visualization of your hideout or your hangout or your or the place where you find comfort, whatever phrase they want to use. And I use the five senses. It takes about five minutes. I ask them to first look at visually this place, have them close their eyes and imagine visually all the textures, colors, comforting, soothing colors of this place. Then we go to sound, what do you hear? What sounds are soothing and comforting to you? Really zoning into that. Then what they feel, so touching something that brings them comfort, having something there um, that wraps them up or um, soothes them in a textual, in a, in a tactile way. Then we talk about taste, bringing foods, comforting foods, uh, nurturing foods. And then we talk about well, I did visual, hearing, taste, oh, tasting. Yeah, I, did. I think I've done all five. I can't remember if I've missed one. But anyway, you get the idea. And they have this, and we practice it in the office with them. And then when they feel uh, stressed or triggered, they can just go to their safe place, either in their mind's eye or go to the washroom and go through the strategy. Sometimes I audio tape the, the the um, visualization strategy, and they can take it home and work at night. They can, in a nanosecond, go to the safe place and automatically um, comfort and calm themselves. Other cognitive behavioral ideas are thought stopping exercises. And dialectical behavior therapy has an exercise called stop. So let's say they're triggered, they're really, really angry, they're in a rage. What they learn to do is stop, just stop, think observe their internal response and process it before they act, before there is some kind of consequence. That really is helpful. And finally, um, Bessel van der Kolk really suggests yoga. Yoga is, has been shown to have great benefit for people who have traumatic stress. So yoga is something they could do outside of their work with you. So the next step, once you have safety and once you have taught them some self-regulation strategies, the next work is about working with the triggers. So they have to understand the neurobiology of the trigger. And those worksheets I've given you uh, before here on the autonomic nervous system and how the brain works on trauma is a psychoeducation that they need to understand um, to understand how the triggers work. Then they need to understand what precipitated the trigger reaction. What was happening in your life at that moment just before you went into that rage, just before you collapsed into that overwhelm? What was happening in your environment? What was said to you? What were you feeling internally? What was going on? So that we can track the pattern here. And then you have to teach them how to manage that emotional trigger. But first, by naming what it is, it's rage, it's anger, it's collapse, it's numbing out. They have to name the physical uh, state that they're in to understand the trigger. Then they want to focus on the social engagement system that keeps them online. Um, I want to read a little paragraph from Bessel's book about the social engagement 
uh, system theory. It comes from uh, Stephen Porges' work on the polyvagal theory. And it's basically the social engagement system is about the vagus nerve that runs down both sides of our body. It's a very extensive nerve system. The vagus nerve is connected to our gut, our hearts, our lungs, our face, our facial, our muscles, our jaws. And I'll just read this to you because it's a very important thing that you want to teach them about what's going on and how they can read another person's face, their tone of voice, and how that can be a trigger for them. So if they're looking at someone and they think it's a disgust, someone is disgusted with them or criticizing them or holding a stigma towards them, it can trigger them. So they have to understand how the social engagement system works. So let me just read this brief paragraph. The social engagement system depends on nerves that have their origin in the brainstem regulatory centers, primarily the vagus, also known as the 10th cranial nerve. Together, together with adjoining nerves that activate the muscles of the face, throat, middle ear, voice box, and larynx, when the ventral vagal runs, runs the show, we smile when others smile at us. We nod our heads when we agree. We frown when friends tell us of their misfortunes. When the vagal system is engaged, it also sends signals down to our heart and lungs, slowing down our heart rate and increasing our depth of breathing. As a result, we can feel calm, relaxed, centered, and feel pleasured, pleasurably aroused. We have to work with the social engagement system when we're talking about triggers, when we're trying to train people on how to be in a calm state. And if we get, can explain to them the physiology of the social engagement system, why we can and can't relate to others, well, when we are attuned with others, that's the social engagement system at work. We also need to teach them how to understand how trauma caused cognitive distortions. You want to work with guilt, feelings, shame, and stigma, which is, a, which is a strong reactions to teen dating violence. You want to help youth notice moments of safety and connection. They're not always out of control. They're not always feeling fearful. We're not always feeling stigmatized or shamed. When are those moments and augment those moments and augment those practices in the real world where there's a counter story, where they're building a different narrative. They're no longer a victim. They have resiliency. So processing the narrative of trauma, I'm just not, I'm not going to go through these. These are the golden standards for trauma treatment. And you have to have training. You have to be licensed in each of these before you can use them. But these are great uh, things to know about if you're going to resource your, your, the youth and have them go out. And if they're really badly traumatized, if they have a, a really bad post-traumatic stress symptom symptomatology, you might want to find an EMDR specialist, a sensory motor psychotherapist, a cognitive behavioral person that understands trauma therapy and has been trained. All of these uh, you can get, you can learn these things. There's many workshops and online um, programs to get the licensing for these. But these are the main standard, uh, golden standards that are out there for trauma treatment. <clears throat> so there are some interventions though that you can use in schools, you can use in agencies, you can use in the community. I'm only going to show you four of them. They're all evidence-based, they're very effective. I've used these first two many times with groups of uh, refugee students, uh, veterans, and veterans' family members. The first is trauma-focused CBT by Cohen. Uh, trauma-focused CBT is an empirically validated intervention for treating children and youth exposed to traumatic events. It's a structured, manualized program. Uh, you can get the training online. These are uh, what it covers. It includes a trauma narrative processing module. CBITS, Cognitive Behavioral Interventions for Trauma in Schools, is also very popular. I ran a workshop with many uh, school counselors in the Lower Mainland of British Columbia, and we studied its efficacy, and it is a very good program. Uh, it is also manualized, and it has a training online. It has 10 sessions, group-based sessions. It includes training in relaxation, dealing with negative thoughts, solving real-life problems, approaching anxiety-provoking situations and coping with trauma events. 
uh, it also has parental support. It includes individual sessions, four group parenting meetings, and an educational session for teachers. And then there are two others, Target and Sparks, also strong uh, efficacy. Target is an empirically validated treatment for adolescents with complex trauma histories and developmental trauma disorders. It is manualized and has 10 to 12 sessions delivered both individually and in groups. It involves psychoeducation and a seven-step sequence of skills using CBT, mindfulness, and experiential approaches. Also, there's some creative art components. Uh, target does not involve trauma processing of memories. So if you feel you're not a trauma expert, don't have experience or education processing trauma memories, Target might be a really good one for you. Sparks is also an evidence-based, um, well-used program, many people using it. Uh, it stands for Structured Psychotherapy for Adolescents Recovering from Chronic Stress. It's for teens of both genders and focuses on coping, relationships, improving functioning in the present. It's comprised of 22 group sessions and combines techniques from trauma programs, such as Target, <laughs> and Dialectical Behavior Therapy for Adolescents. So let's now talk about prevention. I'm going to talk about four uh, ideas around prevention because prevention is really important to stop teen dating violence, per perpetration and victimization before it starts. So I think this is where our efforts should be. Um, so the first one is called Dating Matters, strategies to promote healthy teen relationships. There's a, quite a bit of outcome research on this. There are multiple prevention components to this at the individual level, peers, families, schools, and neighborhoods. It includes the role of gender in relationships. Modules are on youth substance use, sexual risk behaviors, or emotion regulation, acceptance of diverse general roles, and that the relationship level includes peer conflict, parent conflict, peer experiences of teen dating violence. So safe dates is another one that's been around for quite a while. It is evidence-based. They have randomized control trials that support its efficacy. It is a school-based dating violence program for grades eight and nine. There are 10 classroom sessions and it now includes a component of families for safe dates with its own manual. It teaches sexual and behavioral norms for dating, conflict management skills, social control, gender role conflict, victimization, perpetration education, and awareness of service supports. It includes a poster contest. So this, this as you go to a conference and you see people with their posters up. They do that uh, in the school and the student stands beside the poster and those passing by will get a, a little psychoeducation on teen dating violence. The evidence shows that the program is effective for both females and males, whites and non-whites. Next, Public Safety Canada Crimes Prevention Programs. This, this little manual has nine programs that target both youth and their families uh, ages 12 to 17 years, and they provide treatment manuals and offer training with most of these programs. So this is something you can get online. Public Safety Canada Crime Prevention Programs looks like that. It says Implementation Fact Sheets on Promising and Model Crime Prevention Programs, 2012. They're very good. I haven't tried them, but they are empirically based. <laughs> Finally, PrevNet's Bullying Prevention Toolkit. Uh, you can get this resource on their website. It shows you 37 tools to prevent bullying and promotes healthy relationships, offers a leadership training module, and supports the core values of safety, empathy, caring, respect for safety, respect for diversity, and integrity. They also have an online e-learning program for cyberbullying, bullying, a parent's guide to having conversations about online social relations. So out of the four treatment um, modules or programs I've showed you, and out of the four prevention programs for TDV, there's enough resource here to get you started for working on uh, with this topic. Here are some of the references that I've used today. And finally, here are some of the websites for trauma and TD, teen dating violence resources. There are so many more, but I have run out of time and that's where we're at. So thank you. Any questions or comments? Back to you, Wendy.
Well, thank you very much. It's been great uh, to have you, and, and we're delighted uh, that you were able to share the knowledge. And I really appreciated that you took us from theory to practice to program and back. So that was just a wonderful, engaging, and thoughtful presentation. Um, we are uh, yeah. now um, opened up the, the side for questions. So if anybody had any questions, please feel free to, to put them in. Um, I guess one of the things that I had as a question just while we're waiting was, um, what do you see as the most important components to have in a teen dating mm -hmm. violence program wow. based on sort of understanding trauma and addressing trauma? I'm sorry, I was switching my screen. I missed the beginning of the question. Could okay. you I, I was going to say... That? Um, what, do, what do you think in terms of developing programs for teen dating violence, what do you think are the most important components to have in it that, ad, that address the trauma? Well, basically those three main components that I went through on safety. Okay. Safety first, and our, understanding strategies for safety, how to work with triggers, and should happen. And in, in starting sessions with youth, is there a way that you think is, is effective or in your experience is a good way to a best practice to to begin your each of your sessions within your program that is trauma informed? Yeah. So yeah. So the first thing is always the relationship. So uh not coming out first with all the psychoeducation or, or, you know, a person comes and you think, oh, yeah, this is PTSD. I know what to do about that. Uh, back off on that. It's all about the relationship. So they're not, you're not going to get anywhere if you don't have a strong, safe relationship with this, with this student. So it's all about listening. It's all about compassion and attunement. So the best, the first step always is building that relationship. So you don't go into any of the trauma work until you have a really sound relationship with this student so that they feel trusted. You can give them some resources right away, some helpful things to help them get through the night. Uh, you might want to uh, ask permission to speak to their physician to see if there's anything going on there for medications. You also want to make sure that there's a good assessment, and that you have a really thorough history. So we may be looking at complex trauma, a child that has a history of abuse and neglect and you might not know that you might think they're there for the teen dating violence incident but it might be something much bigger than that so you have to have a thorough history but you have to have permission to get that history and you want to take time talking about that because it could be very triggering to get that history okay and and how do you take um you know i think a lot of what you've been talking about is is um, working on one-on-one, -on -one. how do you take some of these concepts to groups? Okay, so before I would put a teen in a group, I would do self-regulation strategies, just what I said about safety first, this, a little bit of psychoeducation, getting all the background information and preparing them for group. So do they have the skills to be grounded, to be able to listen to somebody else's tragic story? without getting triggered, can they manage triggers, then join a group. And all the people in that group, if it was my group, would have these skills. Um, but group work is really important, that they have the idea that others have gone through this and survived, that there's a, that gives them hope, and it also gives them a support system. Um, and they can learn so much from each other, seeing how others struggle, but also manage to move on and get better. Great. Um, I'm just checking. I, I don't seem to see any more questions. Uh, so I think I think we'll uh, just say another huge thank you for all of your work and for your thoughtful presentation. And we're really grateful that you took the time to share your expertise with us today. And to the webinar members, I would ask that you would please remember to fill out the survey and the evaluation to ensure you get your certificate of, of attendance and ensure that we are putting on webinars that meet your needs. So thank you everybody and have a great day. Goodbye, thank you. Bye.